traditional non-volatile memories of NAND and NORFLASH, I want to now continue into the candidates for replacing them, which are known as emerging memories. So, first let's discuss the concept of a universal memory, maybe a utopian universal memory. This would be a single memory technology with the advantages of all existing technologies and without their limitations, something that would cross this entire stack that we saw before of the memory hierarchy and provide one solution, you know, one ring to fit them all, one solution for everything. The requirements of such universal memory are to start with high density. We want something really that can give us high density that can uh, we can have as many bits as possible on the chip. So I just want to mention with that uh, this thing called F square, which has appeared several times in the slides, but I haven't really discussed it yet. So F square is the minimum bit cell size measured. Um, uh, measured where F is the minimum feature size. So if we have our feature size, which is say 14 nanometers or something like that, that would be, you know, the pitch of an interconnect layer actually. And since we need usually something like the, the, a word line and a bit line, we can cross them. So one word line going like that with a, a feature size of F and one bit line crossing it with a feature size of F. And we need spacing of another F between each word line and each bit line. And we need at least this cross bar um, in order to create one bit cell. So the um, cross section of such a thing um, would be, you know, F squared. And then having uh, the spacing with it, we get 2F by 2F, which is 4F squared. And 4F squared is basically the minimum size that we can have of one bit, assuming that we need to access it with, um, with at least a word line and a bit line. And often, as we'll see, we can make a bit that really fits into that cross section of the uh, two uh, word lines. So F squared, 4F squared is the minimum size that we can theoretically make a single bit, whereas if we 3D stack them on top of each other, then we can get something that's 4F squared divided by the number of stacks we have, and also if we have multi-levels inside our bit, we can get, again, higher density. Okay, but really the physical um, spatial resolution of that would be a minimum of 4F square, and anything that we can get, um, you know, that is 4F square is good. So a high density is um, the, the, you know, primary thing that we look at when we discuss memory. And flash, for instance, especially NAND flash, is what, is what we would, you know, take as our representative of such a high density memory. Scalability, so we want something that can continue to scale along with Moore's Law, along with our, um, you know, newer and newer process nodes. And of course, SRAM is the thing that we basically build our process nodes for. So we want some memory that can scale along with our logic, along with our, uh, similar to how SRAM does. We want unlimited retention, so um, something that really will hold the data that we write to it forever, and so it should be a non-volatile type of memory, so, uh, similar to flash or a hard disk drive or something like that that's going to keep the memory even when we turn off um, uh, you know, the, uh, the power and so forth. So it should retain the memory as long as possible, um, unlike DRAM, which will lose its, its uh, data after a, a while, and uh, SRAM, which you need to keep on the battery. High performance, so um, SRAM is our, you know, main memory that we use um, up here as caches that we can, you know, uh, access within a single cycle or something like that. So we want to have this universal memory also provide this performance of uh, similar to SRAM where we can read it and or write it within, you know, a single cycle or a, a small number of cycles. We want it to have unlimited endurance. So a problem with uh, things like flashes, since we're moving, you know, the um, the uh, electrons through uh, the floating gate, eventually we break them down. So they have a limited endurance that you can only write, you know, 10,000 times to it or something like that. On the other hand, if we talk about something like SRAM or DRAM, which are, you know, just moving around regular electrical current, there is no problem with that, and they basically have unlimited endurance. So this is another property we would want from such, an un uh, such a universal memory. Process integration, so something like SRAM, we can make it in our logic processes. We don't need to add any special masks or any special steps. We can just make it. Uh, we don't need a, a different chip and a different foundry, such as we need for something like DRAM or Flash um, or something like that. So if we can integrate our memory within our process and have it embedded, even if it costs us with uh, uh, several more masks, but not uh, something substantial that will really um, change the, the, the price of our chip in such a dramatic way, then that's something that we want. So so SRAM is one of those. Uh, embedded DRAM is something like that, but it is not. Uh, the process integration has been harder, and so I don't know if we should take that as a good example. I want to also mention here that with processes, you know, there are certain materials.
materials that we have inside foundries. And uh, if we want to introduce a new material, that's always a big problem. It takes many years. It can cause real problems with the other um, materials that are already inside this very clean environment and so forth. So um, op optim optimally, it should work with um, materials that we use currently in our foundries. And finally, um, low power. So of course we want our memory to not take a lot of power. And so if we take one of these non-volatile memories, they don't have any leakage and that's a real important thing. In um, recent years, SRAM, having so much SRAM on the chip and the SRAM sits there and has many leakage paths through it, we have this um, notion of dark silicon. All of this silicon that's wasting power through leakage that can often dominate the whole power um, of the chip and you know drain the battery or whatever. So th that's one thing. And the other thing is that we want to access it with low energy because um, these many, many accesses to the memory, they can really dominate the dynamic power of a chip. So we want it to work with low power and possibly low voltage, which really will save us on power. So that's the notion of a universal memory. And there have been many attempts to try and uh, develop such uh, universal memories. There was even a, a paper, I believe, this year in uh, Nature or one of the big uh, international um, you know, journals that said uh, that, that, that there's been research that they have a new universal memory candidate. But up till now, we haven't found one but I will discuss um, kind of the things that have been trying to find or at least fulfill this uh, emer emerging space of uh, trying to find something that will provide us all, uh, as many of these requirements as possible. So before I want to start that, I want to talk about one of the um, great breakthroughs, I would say, of the physics world in the last, you know, um, several decades. And um, if we take it, we can look at the four basic circuit variables that we, you know, generally um, have. And um, of course we can start with voltage and voltage uh, is uh, we, we will mark it with V and we will put it as a little circle up on top here. And our other main you know variable is current. And we have this uh, cool relationship between voltage and current that we all know called Ohm's law, which says the voltage is something, you know, some constant time the current and the, this constant we'll call it in R and that R, the, the element that provides this constant of R, we have called it a resistor and we call this R um, resistance. So that provides this, you know, relationship between voltage and current and we get this element that is called a resistor that, um, that it provide a physical element that, that shows this relationship. We also have something called charge and charge we also see that there is this, um, this relationship between voltage and charge and the constant that provides this uh, relationship between voltage and charge we call it capacitance, the C, and we found an element that is called the capacitor that you know provides this uh, relationship between voltage uh, between uh, uh, voltage and charge and it's called a capacitor. So we have these two relationships so far and we also found another one that's called flux and flux provides a, a relationship between um, a, a flux and current which is called inductance and the element that provides that is called an inductor and we mark that as L. We also found that there is a, a cross relationship between you know the voltage and the flux and between the current and the, the charge and this um, this relationship is uh, um, it, you know is shown here and so this is really cool because we have this cross relationship this whole nice uh, square here that shows our, our things but there's actually something missing over here what is the element that provides this um, flux to uh, charge relationship and um, back in the 70s professor Leon Chua he inv he looked at this he drew out this kind of graph and said listen there's this mi missing element and he called this element the memristor and he gave it a, a, the um, you know the relationship a name M and basically he showed that this thing is, is a type of an element that can have resistance that can be programmed that can be changed and this thing that remembers its resistance is called the memristor. I've also had the pleasure to meet and um, and be, befriend uh, Professor Steve Kong who was a Professor Chua's um, student who developed a lot of the theory behind this and this was a completely theoretical thing back in the 70s. Um, this known missing element, the missing fourth, fourth element, the memristor. The amazing thing is that there was this uh, uh, breakthrough in 2008 when all of a sudden HP Labs um, uh, published this letter inside Nature saying that the missing memristor was found and they showed this element over here that you can see where we have this uh, piece of uh, you know material that part of it is doped and part of it is undoped and they showed that by applying all kinds of uh, um, uh, fields on top of it you can change 
the ratio between the doped and the undoped material inside, and it will get stuck that way. And when you have an undoped material, you have a high um, resistance, and when you have a doped material, you have a lower resistance, and that is basically this kind of programmable resistor inside a solid state circuit, and this is exactly a uh, memristor. So they found this missing memristor. We also look at this type of uh, thing with this hysteretic behavior. Um, you have, you know, the, the, uh, the, the current versus the voltage, so the gradient of this is the resistance, and you see that when you, once you apply some sort of a large voltage, um, you have this uh, resistance that is, is, is at one uh, state, and when you pass a certain point, it changes and the resistance becomes something else. So that is exactly a, 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 a memristor, something that remembers the resistance, something that we can program the resistance with some external fields. So this was a big breakthrough where they actually found this theoretical element that Professor Chua and Professor Kong had um, talked about, you know, 20, 30 years before that and had made lots of these theoretical papers, but now we had this actual thing. And um, Professor Chu, I've heard of him in, in a talk, he likes to see uh, say uh, since HP's you know, breakthrough of uh, actually showing this, that actually many of the things that we've been using in the past, even um, our traditional flash cell, they're actually memristors. Um, these things that are programmable resistors. And it led to this, you know, uh, I guess it, it, it broke through the way for this rise in these resistive memories, even they, though they've been started to be developed before this. Um, so these resistive mem memories are all, I guess, a type of memristor, if you go by uh, Professor Chua's um, kind of uh, uh, terminology of this. So I want to go over for a second what charge is versus resistive memories. So the memories that we you know, traditionally use, like DRAM, they're charge-based memories. What we do is we write data by capturing uh, um, charge, Q. So we, we took a capacitor and we um, put charge onto the capacitor and we stored it there and that stored our data. Now we read it out by detecting the voltage change over the data. That was a charge-based memory. On the other hand, a resistive-based memory, which we're going to be discussing nowadays, what we do is we write the data by um, applying some field. So we put some you know, uh, current pulse a current or something like that through uh, an element, and that will store the data as a resistance in the data. And so what we do then is we read the data by trying to detect that resistance, and that's often using a resistive crossbar, as I'll show immediately. So that is a resistive memory. It has a very different operation than a charge-based memory, and most of the things I'm going to show you today are resistive memories. So uh, before we start, I want to take the array architecture of the resistive memory and go over it because it's an important part of how these things are constructed. So basically, if we talked about um, something like a NOR flash or an EEPROM, um, what we had here was what, what we had a, um, a, a resistive element. Um, so that would be one of these guys over here. And we had some sort of a selector, which would be uh, a transistor that could enable or disable um, a, you know, the, the operation of this, uh, this thing according to a, um, a cross between a word line and a bit line. So we have the word lines, which are going horizontally over here and we have the bit lines that are going vertically. And what we're gonna do then is we're gonna apply some sort of a voltage on the bit line. It could be a zero or one, depending on how we wanna read it out. And um, on the source line, we're also gonna put some sort of a, uh, a voltage, so it would probably be the opposite voltage of the bit line. So for example, we could put on the bit line VDD and on the source line ground. And then we're gonna turn on a word line one of the word lines, we're going to pulse it up. And so what we're going to get is uh, this transistor is going to always turn on. And depending on if we have high resistance or low resistance here, we're going to have inside our source line either a high current or a low current. And that we can detect with, you know, a sense amplifier or something like that that's sitting at the end of it and tell us if we are in the high resistance or low resistance state for that cross between the word line and the bit line. Um, so that is how something like uh, even the, the NOR flash that we discussed before works. Um, the problem with that is that we need this uh, transistor that's inside and, uh, and inside this thing, and that will lead us to a minimum probably of something like 8F square for, um, for implementing these. And remember I said before that our, our, our um, theoretical limit is to have a 4F square cell, so 8F square is not that great. So it's really, uh, I guess, I would say easy to implement one of these types of arrays, but for every resistive element that we have over here, we have to have a selector that is going to be like a transistor, which we would make on our front end layers, which is gonna take up a lot of room and so forth, and gonna really um, uh, limit 
the density of what we can do. But this is a way that um, these things are done, and there are many of these currently done, and you can see here this resistive element in, in between the bit line and the source line connecting them. So the other way of doing it, which really provides us the extremely high density, is what we call a cross point or a crossbar array. And this, if the other one was called a 1T, 1R array because we needed a transistor and a resistor to make it, here we just take one resistor and place it in between our word line and our bit line. So then we're going to pulse our word line, for example, high, and we're going to see if our bit line gets current or not. And then we will know if we had a high resistive or a low resistive state on you know one of these uh, bit lines and this can really provide us with a, a complete um, for r square type of a uh, density because you know we just need this cross between the word line and the bit line and if we can somehow create our resistor right in between these cross points and uh, we can do it as you can see here something like inside the vias or something like that then we can really achieve this maximum density. There is a, a huge problem here though called sneak path. So um, let's say we turn on this word line and um, we wanted to read out you know, all of these bit lines in parallel. Um, but once we turned on this bit line, um, okay, and we had a, you know, a low resistive state going through here, um, what can happen here is that uh, you know, we can, if we had a low resistive state, for example, on this guy over here, we have a sneak path where the current will not only go down to our bit line, it'll also go through, um, you know, this, this uh, uh, resistor, this low resistance state over here into this word line. And that will change our voltage uh, divider. It will change a lot of things. They get kind of screwed up. It might even go through here. There are all these sneak paths that, grow, that go through here. And so it's very problematic basically to read out these things. One way of doing it is we can pulse, you know, the uh, different um, lines over here. And this is done also um, for programming uh, ones or zeros inside our, or our resistors because we need to do these things. But we put different voltages across the bit lines and across the word lines in order to select or unselect things. And we kind of hope in a lot of ways that this is going to work. But that really causes a lot of problems. The sneak path problem has been a huge problem, and um, most um, uh, cross point or crossbar arrays have failed up till now, even though these are um, ideas that have been around for many, many, many years. Um, so one of the things that has uh, enabled a breakthrough, which has commercialized a lot of these things, is the option of integrating a selector inside our, um, our cross point. So as you can see here, now we have uh, next to our resistor, we also have some sort of a selector and the selector can be a diode where the diode will only let the current run through one way. And if we actually have, as you can see here, a, um, a, a two directional diode that enables us also to, if we apply enough voltage, we can really um, operate this in the opposite direction, but only in certain cases, and that enables us a, um, a two-directional programming, as we will see that some of the architectures we need to um, drive a current in one direction to write a one and drive a current in the other direction to write the other. So this bidirectional type of diode, on the one hand, if we apply a low enough uh, type of a voltage or a current for a read, it will, not pro it will not program it and it will not go opposite way through uh, the wrong way through the uh, selector, but on the other hand, it still enables us, if we apply a high enough voltage or current, to um, drive the, uh, the, the fields the other way and program the opposite, um, the opposite state inside the resistor. So the option of these selectors and what we call a 1T, 1S type of a, uh, of a configuration has enabled some of the architectures such as PCM, as we'll see um, soon, to really take off and start becoming commercial products. Now, quickly, the four leading candidates for uh, emerging non-volatile memory technologies that are around today, and then I'll go a bit more in detail about the different ones. So the first one is called PCM, or phase change memory. And in this one, what we're going to do is we're going to inject current to change the material phase, and the resistance is dominated by phase. So a bit cell looks something like this, a uh, nice little uh, mushroom over here. Um, well, if it, depending on the state of this mushroom, either we have high resistance or low resistance according to the phase. We'll see that in a second. Okay, the other one is called a magnetic memory or um, MRAM, and the leading one for these days is called spin transfer torque and RAM, MRAM. Uh, and in this one, we um, have something called the pin layer, which will have a certain spin inside, magnetic spin, where it will, as you can see, the, the, the up arrow shows that all of, or most of the um, 
uh, cells over here, have, the, most of the electrons over here have an upspin, and we have a free layer that can be programmed either to have an upspin or a downspin on most of the layers in here. And depending on if they are parallel or anti-parallel, in other words, the arrows are the same direction or opposite direction, we get a, um, a, uh, a low or a high resistance. The third one, which is generally what um, the, the memory, what is called a memristor, even though again Leon Chua says that all of these are actually memristors, um, but it, it's more uh, more commonly called RAM or RERAM, in other words, a resistive RAM. And again, all of these are kind of resistive, so uh, you could categorize all of them as resistive. But the ones that are traditionally called in industry nowadays RERAM or RAM, um, they usually use this uh, type of uh, uh, conductive filament where we have you know two electrodes and between them we either have a conductive bridge or we don't have a conductive bridge and we can program it to uh, be there or not and it causes high or low resistance. And finally, a kind of new candidate um, that has arisen in the last uh, couple of years has been this big breakthrough of being able to use the ferroelectric uh, effect, which means that we have this electrical dipole inside uh, uh, certain types of materials. And depending on if we have the dipole push it pointing up or pointing down, um, we can get a different uh, uh, resistance inside. And re really, um, in the last couple of years, there has been a big uh, uh, breakthrough that um, ferroelectric RAM, which was not really a candidate in, uh, before that, has become one of the, um, the, the candidates to be the actual winner of these emerging memory technologies. So let's start with phase change memory because it is really the most mature of all of these. So um, uh, <laughs> chalconogenide gas, that's kind of hard to say, um, is a, a glass, is a type of material that exists in two states. And now I just want to say that this is so old that we actually had it inside our CD-ROMs and this is basically how, you know, we were able to program and read out and so forth um, our, our classic CD-ROMs. But uh, uh, the scaling it down and putting it inside chips uh, at, a, at a nanoscale or like a 4F square type of a, of a size, that is what has made it uh, now into a commercial product. And um, so what we have here is we have this uh, chalcogenide uh, material over here, which has two states. It can be either crystalline, where we have these nice structures of the atoms, as you can see over here, or amorphous, where the atoms are kind of random. And there is a big difference between the, um, the resistance of the amorphous area and the crystalline area. When we have everything in a nice crystalline area, we get a real low resistance. When we have everything or most of it in an amorphous area, we have a high resistance. And one of the cool things about that is you can have some sort of median point where some of it's amorphous and some of it's crystalline, and therefore you can actually separate between you know um, several levels and have a multi-level cell that can uh, have more than you know uh, zero and one inside. It can have several levels of bits. So what do we do over here to program it? We actually, um, again, we're going to heat up the element here. It's this filament. We're going to heat it up. And depending on the way that we heat it up, it's either going to become amorphous or become crystalline. So um, really what we do is if we take it to uh, reset it, we, we, we uh, give it a high temperature or a high current, basically, for a very short period of time and then quickly cool it off. And what happens when we give it this pulse, everything's going to kind of break up the atomic structure and it's all going to become amorphous and get a high, um, uh, high resistance. But on the other hand, if we give it a median type of a, of a heat and let it, you know, um, kind of, uh, 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 kind of uh, uh, set itself in this nice crystalline structure and cool maybe more um, uh, uh, slowly, you know, we, we get this annealing type of effect that, that gets everything um, to a crystalline state. And that is called the set pulse and that gives it a, a, a low resistance, which is the logical one. Then when we read it, we just use a much lower um, uh, current, a much lower voltage, and we don't get the high temperatures and it doesn't change the state of it. So that is how we um, kind of uh, program our um, uh, uh, program and read out these, uh, these phase change memories. And really the advantages are that it's shown to be um, scalable. It can scale under 10 nanometers. Again, there, there, for all of these guys, the, there's research that's coming out you know, all the time in every one of our new conferences. Um, if it's IEDM or ISSCC or these different conferences, um, more examples are shown of how you can go to the next uh, technology node and what other tricks can be done. Um, but in general, the prospect is that this can scale, you know, uh, way lower than different things like DRAM and so forth can scale to. Um, 
uh, it's very dense, so we can get do this at a cross point in between, you know, in the vias over there, so we can get to 4F uh, squared. But we can also do this multi-level cells by, you know, having median states between the amorphous and crystalline. And we can also stack these one on top of the other, so we can get something that's way, way lower than 4F squared. Really high density. Um, I don't know if it can get to what uh, NAND flash has been able to get to, because remember, NAND flash, we've been putting in, you know, a few decades of research into it and pushing the technology. But so far, it looks like a good candidate for that. It's non-volatile, so this, again, doesn't change as long as we read. And its read and write performance is really good. It's somewhere between DRAM and Flash. And, and, and already, really, one of the things is to use this as some sort of a persistent memory, which is somewhere between, you know, one of these um, storage class memories that is, is uh, used as a, like a secondary storage or somewhere in between, you know, the uh, DRAM and, and the... And the, and the uh, the secondary storage, but this can be used also somewhere as a like DRAM replacement or something like that with non-volatility. And a couple of years ago, Intel and Micron came out with a product called Optane. They um, say it's a 3D X point technology, but pretty much everybody knows that it is a PCM. Um, they actually worked on this, Intel and Micron. They had uh, a big thing with a spin-off as well called Mnemonics, which was trying to do this 10 or 15 years ago. And and pretty much failed, but they came out with uh, this 3DX point Optane about two or three years ago, and they sell um, high-end hard disks and high-end um, uh, uh, um, uh, memory that sits on top of the, the regular processor chips. And you can get it nowadays, and they're coming out with new and newer uh, products all the time. And hopefully soon it will be uh, low enough to consumer levels. Even though there have been some, uh, Micron actually left this. They closed down their fab that was making it um, sometime around last year. And there's been some rumors that maybe Intel is also going to leave this. But I hope they don't, because this is really giving us a big boost over Flash. And if it gets down to a level of cost that uh, consumers can um, buy easily, then uh, we will all gain from this. So ST Micro also has embedded PCM, and Samsung's been doing this. A lot of the different fabs have been working on PCM, and it's it's already again pretty mature. Um, and we can go out and buy um, these Octane uh, uh, hard disks and so forth, as well as different other products that may have some PCM inside. The second category of, uh, of uh, candidates for emerging memories are the magnetoresistance RAM, where STT, or spin transfer torque, MRAM is the leading one. And here we use a resistance, uh, a, a magnetic effect to store our high or low resistance. And this is actually similar to a magnetic hard drive in a lot of ways. So we use the spin of the electron. So um, depending on the, uh, the type of... Uh, of MRAM we use, we can show here, as I mentioned before, we usually take two um, types of uh, magnetic materials, one we call the fixed layer and one we call the free layer. And in the fixed layer, we have programmed it in such a way or designed it in such a way that the d direction of the spin will not change with the different uh, voltages and currents that we will apply to the, uh, the, the material. On the other hand, we have another one that is called the fixed layer. Uh, we have another one that's called the free layer or the pin layer, and that um, it will store a certain direction of spin according to how we um, uh, push current through, depending on the direction that we push th current through this uh, this uh, magnetic tunnel junction, but um, it, it, it can be changed if we push enough current through in the right direction. So um, this will either program everything to be, you know, over here with the spin to the left or over here to spin to the right. Sometimes it's with spin to the top and the bottom and so forth. And we either have a parallel state where both of them are in the same direction and then we get a low resistance through this, um, this junction or we get the anti-parallel where they're in the opposite direction and then there's a high resistance through this guy. And um, so that is a way that we can program this thing and it's, it's also less invasive than something like PCM which keeps heating up and, and then going down or something like Flash where we're actually moving you know, the charges through a, a, a barrier. Okay, um, so the advantages of this are, again, that it is also scalable, it's really nicely scalable and so forth, and it's non-volatile, and um, the, the read and write performance is faster than something like PCM. It's actually really fast, and possibly it can reach, uh, you know, something that's even better than DRAM, even though really nowadays they talk about it as something that is comparable to DRAM, especially maybe because writes are quite expensive, they need a high energy, and they can take a long time depending on how you make it. Um, and the other thing is it has really nice endurance and retention and it's not, uh, it's not very susceptible to soft errors because it's based on magnetism and not on charge. 
Okay, so um, this is a STTM RAM, and it's really a nice technology that Everspin is a company that has been providing this type of uh, MRAM. Actually, they use something called Toggle MRAM, and they recently transitioned to STT MRAM. They provide um, standalone chips in 28 nanometers. They've shown a one gigabit, uh, gigabit chip. And they've been licensing their embedded MRAM to Global Foundries. And uh, TSMC provides some embedded MRAM. Samsung, Intel, UMC, they're all working on it. So this is also gaining some maturity, even though it's not there yet. Other companies like Avalon, Renaissance, and IBM have shown different examples. And many others are working on STT MRAM or different flavors of, FT, of, of MRAM, trying to commercialize it and get it um, again into our, into our products. Just as a side note about that, uh, uh, a different technology that's very similar called Spin Transfer Orbit MRAM or SOT MRAM is really, uh, it seems like it can be a candidate to be maybe, I don't know if this universal memory, but a replacement for SRAM, which is something that we don't talk about really much. So the, the big problem, I guess, that they show with the SDT MRAM is that you read and write through um, the same path. So either by, you know, driving current in one direction or driving current in the other direction, you change the, um, the direction, uh, the spin of the uh, pinned layer. Um, and then to read through it, you use the same path. And that means that you're really coupled between your read and write uh, paths, and this is, it can be problematic. On the other hand, this uh, SOT MRAM uses a different way of doing it where we actually write through a different line. So um, we, we write through the line over here, directing the current you know, in one of the ways, and it's going to cause our pin layer to change according to the field that is uh, applied to it. And that's really cool because now the write path and the read path, which which goes through here are completely separated and we can um, we can uh, um, uh, get higher write speeds we can get uh, better read speeds it has more endurance because we don't have any effect of the you know of the read changing the uh, actual data and um, it really is a it seems to be like it may be a competitor for an SRAM replacement it doesn't seem to get the same speeds as SRAM but it's in the same kind of order of magnitude and therefore um, as something like a last layer cache replacement it could be a good candidate because um, where we need to access it a bit less but it at pretty high speeds but we get the non-volatility that we don't have in, in SRAM that could be really nice um, the big drawback over here and the reason it is is not a candidate for replacing um, something like a DRAM or a um, or, or a flash is that it needs two selectors. So we need both this uh, this selector and we need another selector over here. Or uh, we need two selectors to really implement this guy, which gives it a high F square, a higher F square than STT MRAM, which also needs one selector and for sure more than something like PCM. As we saw, it can be with uh, you know in one of these one T one S, which uh, gets the four F square type of a, of a sizing. Uh, plus these things things cannot be 3D stacked, at least not really well, and they can't really be used for MLC. So, um, uh, so it's not necessarily a candidate for replacing these high density memories. It still does give a benefit over SRAM in terms of size though. Okay, the next category that we are going to discuss is the RAM or the resistive RAM, RAM. Okay, which I also said is often called a memristor. So um, there are different types of these. There's CBRAM and there's OXRAM. Um, they're basically the same type of thing. It depends on what type of material and how the actual physical effect happens. But you can see down over here, we take uh, a certain material with uh, two electrodes and depending on when you, uh, you, you apply current and which direction and how you do it, you can have a filament that starts to be built until you have a conductive bridge between the two elements which causes a low resistance and if you take it away then you get you know you don't have these uh, this conductive bridge and you get a higher resistance um, so this shows this kind of uh, programming uh, uh, and erasing thing that we saw before in the HP paper where we get this hysteresis of you know different um, uh, different uh, uh, resistances according to how we applied a, a voltage or a current through the device. Um, so there are different ways of doing this. Uh, there are several different materials and a lot of uh, research and uh, some products that have come out with this. 
The advantage of this is, again, it's a very scalable, it's been shown to be, again, a sub 10 nanometer scalable. Um, it's really, really dense, maybe the most dense of all the candidates over here, because first of all, it can be made again in this type of a uh, crossbar type of a solution, which gives us 4F square. But because we can uh, make these filaments, you know, not full, partial, and so forth, we can get this multi-level, um, um, several bits, uh, this MLC, several bits inside a cell. And it's really easy to uh, 3D stack it, as has been demonstrated, and you can see in this kind of nice illustration over here. Of course, it's non-volatile. Um, the read-write performance is okay. It's not as good as uh, MRAM, but uh, some, it, depending on how it's built and so forth, sometimes it can be um, pretty good, sometimes it can be lower. The current availability, so there was a company called Adesto, which was very big on pushing RM. It was purchased by Dialog, um, and they licensed their CBRAM type of uh, product to Global Foundries. Um, uh, Arm uh, spun out a, uh, a company called Surfy Labs, which uh, licensed uh, a uh, technology from another company that's been big on this called Symmetrix. Um, and there's uh, some embedded RERAM that's already offered nowadays by TSMC, by Global Foundries, and different ones like Mitsubishi, Fujitsu, Panasonic, and Winbon are, um, are developing this. Um, one of the interesting and nice candidates is WeBit Nano, which is a company uh, that came out of Israel, and I know the people very well, and I uh, wish them a lot of success in really uh, getting their product out to market. So um, as a kind of side note, I don't know if this could be called a RERAM, there is a, a product called Carbon Nano Tube RAM, um, CNT RAM, or their commercial name is NRAM for this, where we um, use carbon nanotubes, which are this very cool material, to make such a, a conductive bridge or such a, a resistive element. And basically, as you can see here, when we have two carbon nanotubes that are not touching each other, we get a really high resistance between them on the order of a mega ohm. Uh, but when they touch each other, we get a lower resistance, which, um, which uh, can be something that can be uh, um, differentiated from the high resistance. And um, so what we can do is we can, um, again, provide some sort of a, a magnetic field, uh, an electric field on this, and it can take these arrays, these stochastic arrays of thousands of these carbon nanotubes that are um, inside one bit cell and either organize them so they touch each other or move them away from each other so they don't touch each other, and that causes a higher or lower resistance. And then it's held together by strong van der Waal binding forces, so it has uh, this uh, kind of infinite type of retention. So um, according to their estimates, a uh, 5 nanometer bit cell will have have approximately 1,000 switchable CNT junctions, and that can give this high uh, R on off uh, R off ratio, and they show that it can also be 3D stacked. So there's a company called Nantero that has been commercializing this, and maybe we'll be able to see this, even though it's kind of more of a niche candidate for, uh, for the short term. Finally, I wanted to discuss ferroelectric memory, um, FE RAM or FE FET. So interestingly, uh, there is something called ferroelectricity, which um, is basically that there is a material that has an electric polarization that can be reversed by the application of electric field. So uh, according to how you apply a voltage, you can have either this uh, top polarization or a low polarization, or you can see that such a uh, dipole is created by the placement of an atom inside inside the, uh, the uh, crystal. Okay, and um, this is a well-known effect that's been known for a long time, and in fact, it predates a lot of the other types of memories and a lot of the other types of uh, technologies that we use today. In fact, in 1952, this was first uh, demonstrated, and there have been products out since the 80s or so. Um, when they took this, uh, this material, the bit cell based on PZT, and made um, a one transistor, one capacitor cell, as you can see here, so it's similar to DRAM, where we have this selector type of a transistor, and then we have a capacitor that the capacitance is actually, um, we store the polarization on the capacitance, and then we can read it out through a bit line. So it really works similar to a DRAM. Um, with all the pros and cons of that, and there are products out that uh, from uh, that go down to 130 nanometers. It hasn't been able to scale well up till now. There was a company called Ramtron that was then um, purchased by Cypress that has been commercializing this and selling it for many, many, many years. Um, so FRAM was actually something that we didn't talk about much um, until about two years ago. Um, uh, after this big uh, this big um, scientific uh, breakthrough came out, 
when um, I guess not two years ago, but a bit lo longer in 2007, the, uh, the researchers discovered that there is a ferroelectric effect in hafnium oxide. And the big deal about um, hafnium oxide is that it is a material that we use in high K materials and so forth. Um, so it's already inside our foundries. And as I mentioned before, introducing different materials, such as the PZT, into our foundries is a tough thing. But when we have a material such as hafnium oxide that we already are fabricating with and so forth, and know a lot about it and how to use it and so forth, it's easier to get it into the you know high-density processes that we use today. So it took a long time, but NAM Lab in Dresden came out with this uh, thing called a FIFET, which is um, basically taking our, you know, our regular uh, MOSFET cell and adding this uh, piece of uh, hafnium oxide inside that is ferroelectric, and then you can uh, change the polarity of that and it will change the VT of this cell similar to a flash cell. And so this is really from the last couple of years and they've uh, spun out into a company called FMC, which is trying to commercialize this thing. And it really has a lot of, um, of advantages that maybe could, uh, again, be one of the candidates that could win this uh, kind of competition. So as a, a um, um, uh, summary, I guess, to all of this, here's a, a table that I compiled from several of these tables that you can see uh, across the, the net and uh, in many different and in many different publications. Um, I can tell you that uh, these things are not clear cut because research is coming out all the time. There are different types of uh, publications and uh, arguments about these. But you can see what I marked in in red is things that aren't good, like the size of a 60 SRAM cell, which has you know, a large F squared versus the size of something like NAND flash, which has a 4F squared. So if you can get a green, that means we have really a, a nice type of a scaling factor. The yellow is okay. Okay, so it compares between, you know, SRAM, DRAM, NAND flash, and NOR flash, which are our classic kind of uh, memories versus the, the ones that I um, presented above. So phase change memory, resistive RAM on its different flavors, if it's aux RAM or conductive bridge RAM. Um, maybe CNT FET could be also put into there. STT MRAM and really the newer SOT MRAM, which is an interesting and kind of a different candidate. The new FE RAM, I mean, the, sorry, the old F RAM or FE RAM and the new FE FET. And you can see that there are different uh, pros and cons to each of them. No, none of them is completely and totally green. They all have their kinds of problems, you know, if it's the larger cell size or maybe it's that they do um, uh, support, you know, 3D stacking or multi-level bits, um, what their scalability is. Uh, all of these are pretty much scalable, it seems. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about them. You know, the read and write latencies and the energy that we need to usually write can be a problem that it takes a lot of energy to write. As you can see, um, something like uh, STT MRAM always has this problem of uh, high write energy. Um, the endurance, how long they can hold their uh, data, and that's also can be problematic, especially with things like Flash, which was really a big deal. And if they, they all have pretty much retention that is uh, shown to be um, long, uh, long term. So to some, uh, just uh, for some demos, this is a kind of a nice plot that I found on Tech Insights that shows you um, some different uh, companies that have, you know, published these different uh, MRAMs, uh, PC RAMs, uh, RERAMs, um, and FE RAMs. And uh, the, uh, over the you know past 10 years or so, um, up till around 2020, this one is. And it shows you the kind of technology node that these have been demonstrated at and what the capacities that they've shown. So to summarize all of this, what we're trying to do again is to find you know candidates to um, replace the current uh, the current um, uh, memory hierarchy. As we said, we have you know our flip flops for our, uh, our CPU registers, our SRAM for our embedded memory, our DRAM for our main memory, then flash for our you know storage class memory, and maybe second uh, secondary storage is either flash or hard disks. And the question is if we can replace you know these things with um, better solutions, uh, maybe even a universal memory that can cover them all. And we saw that you know at the top level things that can maybe replace SRAM, well probably nothing's going to be so um, in uh, so fast as SRAM is unfortunately. It doesn't look like it. But for lower level caches, um, it looks like something like SOT MRAM could be a good candidate. 
for main memory, there are a lot of these uh, guys who are kind of competitive with DRAM. They're already putting out, for example, the Optane, the 3D exploit, which is PCM. Um, they're putting it out in a dim form factor, so um, they really can be a drop-in replacement for DRAM. However, there are all kinds of uh, tricks and stuff with that because the software assumes that there's a DRAM, and when you have a non-volatile, what we call a persistent, possibly, memory, um, it, it changes the game a bit in terms of the software as well. So this is already available for for, uh, you know, there are dims for, D, uh, for PCM. I think there are some dims for some other uh, technologies too, maybe, maybe some MRAMs um, from Everspin. Um, and, and then, there, again, the, maybe the SDT MRAMs can replace DRAM, maybe PCM can replace DRAM. Um, maybe some, possibly some of the, the resistive memories, the, the RAMs, can also be uh, a replacement, and possibly, I guess, the FE RAM. For storage class memory, all of the above are kind of candidates, even though the ones with the highest density are probably the best uh, candidates. So, so something like the VRAM, of course, uh, Optane is already doing it, so the PCM is um, really going over. Over there. MRAM doesn't have as good uh, density because it needs this selector in general. It doesn't support stacking. It doesn't really support um, a multi-level bit cells. So it's not as much as a storage class memory uh, uh, solution, even though it was considered to be one at some point. And I just want to say that uh, you know, if you're working for a flash company and even for a hard disk company, don't worry. These guys also have a pretty uh, long-term roadmap ahead of them. So they're not going to die anytime soon. There's been a lot of uh, uh, money and technology put into them and they still have a long, a long way to go. So that was it for um, our discussion of other memories and um, as usual feel free to ask me questions on my, um, on my YouTube channel and I'll be happy to answer.